really excited to be here today with you because I heard you just launched in the 80th location. Yeah, Tell we just launched our 80th market uh, yeah. globally. Yeah. Um, it's really incredible to see a company that I had started in the middle of a Starbucks in New York City um, out of my own personal pain point be this product that I'm you know, going to class with someone now in the middle of Singapore. And it's really incredible to see that. What are some of the other locations? Yeah, so we just launched in Hong Kong, Dubai, Bangkok. Um, we've got a few other ones in Europe that are coming out soon. Okay. So it's just a lot of expansion right now. That's great. So let's go back to the very beginning and let's talk a little bit about what inspired you to start the company in the first place and kind of where did you start it and what were the first building blocks you put in place? Yep, so that was just about eight years ago, so I really can't believe it's been that long, but February of 2011, uh, I quit my job and I was at this point in my life where I didn't know exactly what I wanted to be doing with my life, but I loved, I had this passion in my life, which was dance. And I was always searching for new classes to take and I was looking for a ballet class online. And I go online and I'm on Yelp and I'm on Google and I'm on you know, 14 different websites trying to figure out the right class to take. And two hours go by and I realized I didn't find the class I was going to go to and I didn't go. Hmm. And in that moment, I realized that technology could solve a really big problem that wasn't just for me, but for anyone out there who needed to keep their passions in their life or keep learning and making sure that they're growing through life. And we needed to find an easy way to bring that information and data to people at their fingertips. So I was really inspired by, at that time, like OpenTable was out there in a really big company and so was ZocDoc. And I thought that online to offline model was something that the class industry would basically um, thrive from. Great. So we're here to talk about passion in business today. And tell me a little bit more about dance has always been a big part of your life. Obviously, that was the thing that drove you to start this amazing company that helped other people find their passions. Tell me a little bit about dance. How did you get into dance and what, it, what role did it serve in your life? Yeah, so my parents uh, immigrated here in the 70s. Um, they really, you know, when they left India, I think it was a big decision for them. And, you know, one of the biggest things was, you know, raising two girls in, in the middle of America and making sure they had good educations, good careers. And they really, I would say, like invested all of their life and their time into that. That being said, I think it was also important to them to bring our culture with, you know, with them to their kids. And Where in India were you from? Um, I'm from a, a state called Gujarat. Yeah. So my parents um, came here and my, my mom's best friend happened to be a dance teacher. And she started teaching us folk dance in our basements. And this was my childhood. It would be Saturday, Sunday mornings. I would go to dance practice. I would compete in the evenings. And it really became this place in my life where it helped me understood where I came from. Because I didn't really know, right? When you have parents who had immigrated here, um, you, of course, see their life here. And you know, I couldn't really always recognize people around me that looked like me. And I think it was just a really beautiful way of being like, this is where I came from. I love that. So you're growing up in the suburbs of New Jersey. Yep. You're dancing in basements. Yep. As you're getting older, does that start to compete with school and other things you're trying to achieve? Or was it always kind of 50-50? You know, it's an interesting question because I actually, in my town, there weren't many other Indian people. So I actually, I actually faced a lot of racism in my own town. And I had this lovely town nearby, which had a lot of South Asians in it. And so I kind of had this dual identity where I would hide my dancing from part of my life. And then at the same time, I would embrace you know, school and cheerleading and all the other things I was doing in my life. But I think you know, when I think about that part of my life, it was this really amazing time where I learned to overcome adversity. And I think about that as an important thing I've had to do as a woman in tech as well as how do I change people's minds on something that they might not know. And you have to lead in a way by showing them what people can do. And I think that's part of also why dance became this beautiful thing to me is it was my way of showing people, you know, what I would be. So I, you know, of course, like school and education was always the most important thing, you know, for me and my parents. Or I had to make, you know, make sure I got straight A's. It was one of those things where I was a very disciplined kid. Um, I made sure I did my homework and I kind of every free hour I had, I would, you know, either be cheerleading or dancing. And I kind of really spent my time in the most efficient way possible. 
Obviously, that worked. <laughs> you ended up going to MIT. Yeah. When you graduated, did you have any sense what you were going to do with your life? It's funny because MIT has like a massive entrepreneurial school program, tons of things. But when I was there, I never thought I was going to be an entrepreneur. I just knew I was going to immerse myself in my passion, and that's what I did. I started a dance troupe on campus, and I was always helping people, you know, find their way into, you know, we have culture shows that I remember at school, and I would always be leading dance, like dances for them. And basically, every hour I wasn't studying, I was dancing. And I don't, I don't think I really thought way past that. I kind of had always listened to what my parents wanted me to do. And so once I, when I left college, I got a job in consulting. Um, which was a really great job, and of course, like I think at the time, everyone was going into either consulting or banking, and so I chose consulting. And my parents were proud of me, and I got this job, and it it was an amazing three years of my life. But it did take me away from something I loved, which was dance. So, in my third year, um, and I always actually always remember this, I uh, I, I called in sick to go try out for So You Think You Can Dance. <laughs> Not know that, <laughs> and. Um, and I think at that point, I just realized I needed to sort of, I, I trusted that, if, like my, I knew I was smart. I knew if I wanted to achieve another sort of milestone in my career in like the more traditional sense, I could, but I just didn't want to want that anymore. And this is when I took like the first big leap of my life, which was to leave Bain and I got a job at Warner Music Group, um, which was a great job as well, but I ha would have more control over my time. And I needed control over my time in order to really unleash myself, to give myself those hours to dance. And this is when I built my first company, which is my dance company. And that taught me many of the building blocks, which obviously have helped me build ClassPass. So later on, let's go back to that moment where you're trying to find a class, you can't find the class, you realize that there's kind of this hole that needs to be filled, you see other companies doing this in other fields that are related. What was the next step from there? What did you think the company was going to be when you started it? I thought it was going to be a, like a search engine for classes. And, um, you know, we really quickly started scraping all this class data, really trying to make this unbelievable, you know, database of every single class in New York City. So, you know, this took us a year. We built, you know, all the scraping technology and this pretty website that had like every way to search and filter classes. And we launched with about a million classes on the site. And this was in. Uh, June of 2012. Um, we had just completed the Techstars program in New York City, and we launched this product. And it was like crickets. No one was booking anything. There was just no one going to class. And it was really hard. I mean, I think as entrepreneurs, you, you, know, you put your heart and soul into something. You think it's the product that's going to work. And you know, we even had all this press backing because we had just <laughs> completed Techstars uh, and raised some money. So I think it was this really hard moment for me because all these signals that I was following, like people saying I could raise money and that we got press and that, hey, everyone, um, you know, this product was working efficiently, all of that didn't mean that I had actually accomplished my goal. And that was actually, I remember, one of the hardest summers I had because I remember trying to lead the team but I also knew I had to make a hard decision, and this was probably the first of many hard decisions as an entrepreneur you've learned to make, but it was not the right product. And even though we had spent a year building it and you know, probably spent close to half a million dollars working on it, it was the wrong product. What was the disconnect there? We didn't motivate people to actually go to class, and while we had listed every class out there, people didn't, we didn't, really build a value proposition for anyone to be able to say, I have, I'm going to get over my fears of going to class. I'm going to think about this in a different way. You know, and the way I actually realized that was in September of that year, we sent an email and we said, go to class for free. And still no one went. Wow. And at that moment, I think I just realized, I'm like, this is not about money. Like, this isn't even about the technology. And that was something, you know, I personally am clearly like a motivated person. So I think I just realized people are going to want to go to classes and they'll come to the site and book them. But I was missing this whole other psychological part of people really needing to, you know, figure out a way that to understand like, wow, I can keep, keep this as a priority, right? I should explore. I should be active. I could go into a boot camp for the first time in my life. Like those were questions that I think a lot of people 
we're still toying with, and we hadn't addressed anything like that. So how do you go about when you have that moment, you're building something, you have a good team around you, you had great engineers, I remember reading somewhere that you know, it was heartbreaking because your engineers actually had done such a great job right. for you, and yes. they were like, oh, thank you for building this beautiful product that I'm now going to scrap. Right. But you realized that you had to do that to keep growing. What do you do next? Like, what was the thing that kind of unlocked for you what the motivations were of your users? You know, it's just experimenting. I think you, what you learn as, a, especially a consumer product founder, you can't really dictate to customers what they should do. You need to listen to them. Mm -hmm. And I think what we started doing was we started building products and they were really, you know, they were scrappy, they were manual, but they were just like new ideas out there. Like, oh, try 10 classes in a month and see what happens. Try 20 classes here. Go and, you know, discover this one yoga studio. So we were kind of building all these different experimental passes. And we ended up landing on this one product called the Passport, which was a 30-day product where you could go and explore the classes in your, in your city. And it was really interesting because people really loved the product. Like, we were seeing great NPS on it. We were seeing great virality on it. But it was, A, a one-month product. And when we actually started looking at the data, we saw a lot of people frauding us in the sense they were buying the product over and over again. And that was actually like one of our rules that you couldn't do it because we were doing this in partnership with the studios to say, we're going to bring you someone for the first time and then hopefully they'll buy a package. So somebody would create a second login or a yeah, third login. Yeah, we, we were seeing, and you know, the studio owners would call us yelling at us being like, you know, so-and-so came back and we're like, wait, that's not possible. <laughs> Even from like a technical perspective, that was not possible. And so then we started doing, you know, unraveling it a little bit and we realized people loved variety and they wanted to do variety over and over again. Mm -hmm. And we like stumbled upon that, right? And it was, it was interesting, because in, at, at that time, the only real like active and fitness models that existed were all about committing to one genre or, or going to the gym. And so what we kind of realized is, wow, people don't even want to be stuck to one thing. They want the optionality. They want the variety. They're willing to go to a yoga class on Monday and then a spin class on Tuesday. And actually, that's what's actually motivating them to keep going. So the variety was actually the, the thing that made your product distinct. That was, that was like the magic, the magic that fell out of these iterations. Mm -hmm. And I think if we didn't iterate, we would have never discovered that. And did I read somewhere that you actually, you sort of like reduced how much you were standing behind the technology and that you actually were sometimes connecting people to the classes? Like you were going in, you were seeing the requests made and then you were booking them? Yeah, so the whole team, I mean, there was like five of us at the time. We would stay up till four in the morning and literally book these reservations manually. Like we didn't, oh, we didn't have all the integrations built into all these studios at the time. So someone would make a reservation and we would get an email and then go and make the Just reservation. Just back to your room. And yeah, I mean, that, you know, I think what I realized after overbuilding for the first year is I wanted to, no, it wasn't about underbuilding, it was about building a true MVP. And I, I know the word MVP is like thrown a lot, around a lot. I think at the end of the day, you have to make sure that you've created the impact in the world that you went out, went out to. And for me, it was getting someone to class. So until people were going to class, I did not succeed, right? I have not actually accomplished my MVP. And so once I started seeing like the reservations come in, even if they were manual, like to me that was, that was like such a moment to finally celebrate because we had so many months of just no one going to class. And so I think for us, like even though it was manual and I, you know, if anything like, those were, I remember even as a founder, like I wish I enjoyed those days even more because they were really one of the most invigorating times. Hmm. It's interesting, you actually had a connection with each of your users because you were actually tracking what they were doing, what their habits were. You know, I think you said at one point everybody would cancel within the first 15 minutes of having yeah. booked something. So we started realizing so many people would, you know, make a reservation and then cancel it within 15 minutes. So we would just kind of have reservations in the queue and not make them to call them in and yeah. confirm them until 15 minutes because so many reservations were being canceled. So then the you're finally minutes. onto the right path. You're understanding your users, you're figuring out what they want, and then how do you go about building that and scaling that? Yeah, so I think the number one thing, once you have product market fit, and I think, you know, what does product market fit mean? It, once again, it comes down to this idea of people are really living the impact and the mission that you have. And it took us three years to get there as a company, but I actually always remember I knew when we had reached that moment because I literally got like five emails. Like it wasn't even hundreds of thousands of customers. It was five emails from my customers that were saying that they were having, you know, this motivating time on ClassPass, that they had tried studios they never had done before. They felt more confident in their life. This product changed their life. It was this, you know, they were just mounting with the right information of this was why I started the company. And 
you know, I had accomplished my goal. And even if it was just for like five people at the time, I knew I was closer to where I had to get to. And so I think at that moment, I was like, this is it. Like this is, I think as a founder, you know when you've captured that lightning. And until you have that, don't stop. You know, I think a lot of times we want to scale products just to, like, to get products out there. But like when you hit that moment of magic, it's really beautiful. And I, I think about so many times in those three years where we could have missed that. And I'm so glad, even though how hard it was. I mean, we almost ran out of money right before that moment. And I'm so glad we waited to it because when it was there, it was, it was like this magical moment. And then, I mean, and then it, it was like exponential growth. And I think, uh, you know, for us, it really became about how do we launch new cities, you know, making sure that as we were raising capital, we were launching the right cities and making sure what that... What were the next cities that you built out? So the first one we actually did was a test was Boston. Um, and then we went out to Los Angeles and San Francisco. And I think for us, it was making sure that, you know, does the New York phenomenon reside in all cities? And you don't always know that. And I think, you know, we just talked about launching globally. And it's kind of interesting because at the end of the day, we, we tapped into a customer behavior. This idea of people wanting to explore, wanting to play, wanting to find time for themselves. And that's everyone, anywhere in the world. People, all people need to find time to take care of themselves and be active and try all these like new you know activities that are going on in their area and so we had really you know tapped into a, a need on like at the human level and that was like i think you know just one of those moments where we realized like we just need to keep scaling faster and so we kept raise we were raising capital launching more cities raising capital launching more cities we ended up in this one moment i remember and we had a copycat in every city in america it was i remember i time. woke up and, uh, and, you know, I, I really do truly, I lead by this philosophy of you look forward, right? You, no one wins the race looking back. And it just did become really hard around that time. I would literally go to work every single day and have, like, the name of, like, another company with, like, some sort of combination of class fads in their name um, at my desk. And I just remember at that moment where, you know, I think, like, the dancer competitiveness came out of me and I was just like, that's it, like we're going for this. And we raised our series um, B at the time and we raised $40 million and we just went and, you know, took everyone out. Yeah, that <laughs> so one of my favorite things about your story is as you're building this company, you continued to run your dance company too. Tell us a little bit about that. Like how does that work? How did you maintain the passion for both of those things? And how did you even find the time to do both of those things? Time is the most important thing we have. And I think I have learned to be very, very careful with how I spend it, especially because there are so many things I do love in the world and things that I want to do. And I think I was just very clear on the fact that dance wasn't going to, wasn't going to be something that I let go of in my life. And I honestly found a way to fight through it through college. I found a way to fight through it through my early years as an adult in the workplace. And I basically built this product for other people to keep their, whatever their dances in their life, in their, in their life. And I realized in that moment that if I gave that up, I would forget the meaning of why I started my company. And so I think over time, I realized how important it was for me as a founder to stay connected to that fuel every single day. Um, and at the same time, you know, I think it was one of those things that it gave me more and more understandings and learnings of what this special moment in people's time meant and that I wanted to keep making sure that I was bringing to people. And how do you keep that ethos in your office? So you now have how many different offices? We have five different offices and are over 400 employees. Wow. So obviously you want your employees to work hard. You want to be motivating everybody. You want to be scaling. But how do you keep that ethos? How do you keep them passionate? How do you make sure that they all have that balance as well? You know, it's all, it comes down a lot to hiring. I think hiring is, is one of the hardest things to do, but the most important things that will, is the lifeline of any company. Uh, I think so much of the people who work at ClassPass are people who love the product. I mean, literally in our office, people are wearing fitness clothes every single day. They, they go to class during the day. It's, it's just the way of life there. And I think as a leader, I've learned that I have to lead by example. I think there were points where I was like, wait, can I still do that? Can I still go to my bar class at noon? And I was like, wait, I'm going to embrace this. Like, this is, this is what I stand for. And this is what I want my company to stand for. This is what I want the rest of the leaders in the world to be doing and letting their employees do because people sometimes need a break. Like you can't sit at your desk for eight hours straight. And I think that's sort of the ethos those in our in our company is you know be where you need to be when you have to but you know take care of yourself you know at the end of the day you can only 
really put out great work in the world if you take care of yourself. And sometimes you do need that, you know, quick class in, inside. Okay. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so we're running out of time. One of the things I love about you is that you are always trying something new and throwing yourself out there, and you're just always willing to take a risk and put yourself out there first. So what's next? Oh, my God. There's so many things. Um, you know, I, I'm one of those people who uh, will constantly try and evolve as a human being. I think, you know, you never want to stagnate. Um, so I'm always trying, you know, new classes. <laughs> That's always one of my favorite things to do. Um, and it's really exciting because class passes, uh, the vision of ClassPass is really to be the destination for all your free time. So while we have been a fitness company, um, and we actually started when I was talking about the open table model, we actually had photography classes on there and art classes on there. Um, and so it's really exciting because we're at this phase now where we're actually starting to launch some new inventory. So things like wellness, so you can get a massage on there, beauty, acupuncture. Um, so I'm really excited about evolving the platform into really what the vision is. Great. Well, we are exactly out of time. It was such a pleasure Great. to talk to you here today. Thanks, Thank Molly. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.